Welcome. Susan Sontag was an occasional rather than a habitual writer of short stories. Turning to the form as certain expressive needs arose that couldn't otherwise be satisfied. Some pitched battle for wisdom is underway in each of the 11 works in this newly published book called Debriefing. A debriefing follows on some experiential blow. Such avowals did not come easily to Sontag. Reading these stories now, particularly the most personal, one sees why. Anton Chekhov, the greatest of short story writers, spoke of his autobiographophobia, a condition Sontag strongly identified with. In masterworks of hers, like Project for a Trip to China, Debriefing, Unguided Tour, and others, she outwits a native reticence. The weight of trouble, such stories shift. The death of a father, the suicide of a friend, the threat of mortal illness, sets them at a distance from her much larger and more frequent production of essays. If the latter will always be more famous, the stories are where to go to know Sontag most intimately. She once told an interviewer that while the living room was fine for essays, short stories needed to be written in the bedroom. This distinction between outer and inner sancta seems a good way of approaching the contents of this new book. The stories are her innermost work. A few critics have said that Sontag's stories might as well be called personal essays. I think this misses the point. Sontag regarded essays as arenas for coming to understand what she thought, for making up her mind. Her stories spring, by contrast, from a need to remain in suspense, to keep hold of contradictions, but also <clears throat> to make this perplexity bear fruit. I would gladly consent to being silent, she writes in Project for a Trip to China, but then, alas, I'm unlikely to know anything to renounce literature, I would have to be really sure that I could know, a certainty that would crassly prove my ignorance. Sometimes gnomic, as in the story Baby, or American Spirits, sometimes plangent, as in Unguided Tour, The Way We Live Now, and Project for a Trip to China, the voice here is everywhere terse, bracing, distilled. Sisyphus I she writes in debriefing. I cling to my rock. You don't have to chain me. Stand back. I roll it up, 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 and down we go. I knew that would happen. See, I'm on my feet again. See, I'm starting to roll it up again. Don't try to talk me out of it. Nothing, nothing could tear me away from this rock. Craving more uncertainty than the essay allowed for, Sontag turned from time to time to a form in which one need only persevere, making up one's mind about nothing, the infinitely flexible, ever amenable short story. I suspect that a new generation of readers, less troubled about genre than their elders, will now find these stories of hers entirely contemporary. Susan turns out, as usual, to have been ahead of the crowd. And here's a little example of how she did it in a story memoir or memoir story. I don't quite know what it is, but I put it at the head of uh, uh, this volume called Pilgrimage. Memoir of adolescence, <clears throat> story of adolescence. I accumulated gods. What Stravinsky was for music, Thomas Mann became for literature. At my Aladdin's cave at the Pickwick Bookshop on November 11th, 1947, taking the book down from the shelf just now, I find the date written on the flyleaf in the italic script I was then practicing. I bought the magic mountain. I began it that night and for the first few nights had trouble breathing as I read. For this was not just another book I would love, but a transforming book, a source of discoveries and recognitions, 
all of Europe fell into my head, though on condition that I start mourning for it. And tuberculosis, the faintly shameful disease, so my mother had intimated, of which my hard to imagine real father had died so long ago and exotically <coughs> elsewhere in China, but which seemed, once we moved to Tucson, to be a commonplace misfortune. Tuberculosis was revealed as the very epitome <clears throat> of pathetic and spiritual interest. The mountain-high community of invalids with afflicted lungs was a version, <coughs> an exalted version, of that picturesque, climate-conscious resort town in the desert with its 30-odd hospitals and sanatoriums to which my mother had been obliged to relocate because of an asthma-disabled child, me. There on the mountain, characters were ideas, and ideas were passions, exactly as I'd always felt. The ideas themselves stretched me, enrolled me in turn. Setembrini's humanitarian elan, but also NAFTA's gloom and scorn, and mild, good-natured, chaste Hans Castor, Mon's orphan protagonist, was a hero after my own unprotected heart, not least because he was an orphan and because of the chastity of my own imagination. I loved the tenderness, however diluted by condescension, with which Mon portrays him as a bit simple, over-earnest, docile, mediocre, what I considered myself to be, judged by real standards. Tenderness. What if Hans Castorp was a goody two-shoes, appalling accusation my mother had once let fly at me. That was what made him not like, but unlike the others. I recognized his vocation for piety, his portable solitude, lived politely among others, his life of onerous routines that guardians deem good for you, interspersed with free, passionate conversations, a glorious transposition of my own current agenda. For a month, the book was where I lived. I read it through almost at a run, my excitement winning out over my wish to go slowly and save her. I did have to slow down for pages 334 to 343, <laughs> <clears throat> when Hans Castorp and Claudia Chauchat finally speak of love, but in French, <laughs> which I'd never studied. Unwilling to skip anything, I bought a French-English dictionary and looked up their conversation, <laughs> word by word. Well. <laughs> Very winning. <laughs> well, um, I was sort of Susan to her Thomas Mann, okay? Uh, I came to New York in uh, 19... Uh, 1969 from Yale School of Drama where I had encountered my first New York intellectuals and um, it, it was 1969 when I got to New York so 67 to 69 I was at Yale Drama School and learning about Karl Marx and you know George Lukacs and studying with Richard Gilman and Gordon Rogoff and hearing this name, Su Susan, they'd say, Susan. Um, and uh, then there was uh, Paris 1968, All Power to the Imagination, which was, seemed to be saying exactly what we were all thinking. And then there was Susan talking about the erotics of art, which was just right on the money of what we were all thinking and feeling and rebelling by means of. Um, I just am gonna make a, a, tell you a little list of some sightings uh, because it was like sightings of Susan Sontag for a young woman in her uh, 20s like me. She was like beauty, she was thought, she was inquiry, she was mystery, she was always telling me via the New York Review of Books what I should read, she, to, how to keep me ahead of everything. So 
1973, The Life and Times of Joseph Stalin by uh, Robert Wilson at BAM. It was a 12-hour uh, theater piece in silence. Um, and uh, everyone was there. Uh, I just remember Julian Beck, and I remember Susan, and I've forgotten it, Julian Beck, Judith Molina, Op uh, the Living Theater, and sort of everyone else whom I recognize but can now not remember, but Susan Sontag. And then uh, I, I was taking photographs at the time, and I was invited to be the photographer on a day of shooting of, or maybe a weekend of shooting, of women filmmakers. And we were gonna meet Susan Sontag at JFK. She was returning from finishing shooting her film, Promised Lands, about uh, Palestine and Israel. And, um, and I got to be with my Nikon uh, taking these pictures. Um, and that day there was Shirley Clark and Julianne Wang, who had been the first woman in the uh, 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 you know, director of photography union. Anyway, now then this thing happened, which was that feminism happened. And so I was taken up by feminism, and it seemed that Susan Sontag was not. And um, uh, then came my mother dying of cancer. Then came Susan Sontag uh, having cancer. And then came Einstein on the Beach, another Ro Robert Wilson theater piece, this time at Philharmonic Hall. I was there, everyone was there. And coming into the one of the boxes was Susan Sontag with her entourage, um, her first time, at, you know, very soon after her cancer. So that was sort of amazing. There she was, she was alive, she had survived this thing, which my mother had not. Um, friends of mine interviewed her for a magazine <laughs> called Chrysalis, a magazine of women's culture. And they were bound and determined to get her to be open about her love of women, to get her to admit that she actually was a feminist. And they had this incredibly open interview with her, which she then refused to let them run. <laughs> um, then uh, I went to the Gotham Book Mart for a book party. I have no idea what book but there was Susan Sontag. And so I said, hello, I'm Honor Moore. And she said, I know who you are, and ah. turned away. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> then came Abel Goss's film of Napoleon at Radio City Music Hall with a new overture and soundtrack composed by uh, you know, Francis Coppola's father, mm -hmm. and everyone was there, including Abby Hoffman, <laughs> who was just, had just surfaced after having been underground and after having had cosmetic surgery so that he wouldn't be recognized, and Susan Sontag. <laughs> <laughs> then I left New York. I couldn't. Right, and unlike Susan Sontag, I couldn't write in New York, so I left. And, uh, but I, can't, I was invited to come in and go to a meeting at the New York Institute for the Humanities, one of their Friday lunches. And it was to hear Joseph Brodsky. Well, of course, I whipped in from Connecticut. And I never wear dresses, but for some reason I wore a linen dress the color of burlap that day. I never wore the dress again. <laughs> um, and uh, there was Joseph Brodsky and Susan Sontag. And she, I had no idea that they had been lovers or 
anything, but all I did know was that she was right, asking these sort of amazing questions and he was jabbering away in the most brilliant, extraordinary way, making puns between tail, T-A-I-L, and T-A-L-E, that you, that a writer pulls a T-A-L-E behind him while a, you know, a rat has a T-A-I-L, and, and so on, very fast and very uh, Joseph Brodsky. Um, so there were other sightings. And then finally, uh, there was a reading by a French writer named Fleur Jaggi. This was in about 2004. And I went to it, and by then, uh, oh, after the Joseph Brodsky thing, Brodsky thing, she had said, oh, hello, we should really get together. We have so many friends in common. And so I waited by the telephone, you know. <laughs> So after this Fleur Jaggi thing, I went up to her and I said, hi, it's on, oh, I know who you are. And uh, uh, I said, um, well, it would really be nice to get together sometime. I don't know how I had the nerve to say that, but I did say that. And she said, well, let's do it. And I said, well, uh, what should I do? She said, call me tomorrow morning. It was like, I said, okay, I will, as if it meant, you know, it was like no big deal. Um, and uh, so I did call her the next morning. I did, some, you know, person answered the phone, and then I said, oh, it's Honor Moore, and I heard her voice, a kind of yelp of delight. Mm -hmm. So uh, we made this date for dinner, and I got the flu. Oh. So I called up and I said, I have the could we postpone? And she said, you know, I'm sick too, but I wasn't going to postpone because I thought, you know, maybe we'd never have this dinner. So anyway, we postponed, we had the dinner. I brought with me the photograph that I had taken of her all those years ago. She looked at it and she said, I was good looking. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, <clears throat> We all were, and we had no idea. <laughs> and we proceeded to have one of these, just, the apartment was like a kind of um, paradise of what you would dream of living in if you were Susan Sontag. And posters of Lenin and red uh, cushions and endless, endless bookshelves and, you know, view and... We sat in the kitchen at a wooden table and we talked, 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 talked. And I, I was working on a book about Amy, a collection of Amy Lowell's poems for the Library of America, and I told her that, and she said, Amy Lowell, have you read her book about the French poets? And I said, N not yet. And she said, you haven't done your homework. <laughs> I'll give you my copy. And she went racing around to try and find a copy, which soon I said, oh, I promise I'll read it. She said, well, it's the first book of criticism I ever read. And it inspired me about criticism. And then she gave me um, her book. She asked me what book of hers I wanted, and there's one detail, which is her, of course you've read this, and of course you have that, and you have illness as metaphor, and of course you've read, yes, yes, yes. So I took her sort of final book of essays called uh, Where the Stress Falls, and in preparation for today, I read in it a, an essay called The Poet and Prose, is more or less the title of it. And it was a kind of magical Susan Sun. This is, it sort of illustrates uh, who she has always been to me, uh, which is that um, she, uh, um, oh, what am I talking about? I just lost my train of thought, because I, because uh, I remembered that she died after this. Um, she had walked me, she walked me to the corner after our dinner and she said, I hope we'll know each other. And we, we never saw each other again, but we talked on the phone. Um, but I read this, the book of, I read that essay, The Poet and Prose, and it turns out to be about Marina Svetaeva, 
who's my favorite Russian poet. And um, I'm writing a, a book now about my mother. And the essay that she really likes most is one called Mother and Music, which Marina Svetayeva wrote about her mother. And the whole essay is about a poet's prose and how most poets sort of resign from their poetic voice when they write prose. And I'm a poet and a prose writer, and it's an issue for me. And so it was sort of like, there she is, sort of helping me out with this problem, conundrum. And I'm just going to read something, half a page from my book about my mother. In an auditorium in New York at a memorial for a woman with black hair, a woman also with black hair plays Mozart. I am playing for Susan, she says, bowing, and takes a seat at the piano. I listen to that same woman through earphones now, also playing Mozart. One warm February evening, Susan and I had dinner for the first time. Afterward, in the lit New York dark, she walked me to the corner and we embraced. Embrace of sisters, of mother and daughter. I hope we will know each other, she said. When I next telephoned, she took time to congratulate me warmly on a prize I'd gotten, but she sounded rushed. We're dealing with a few things here. I'll call you soon. She did not call, and a year later she was dead. Always in my life, just beyond reach, there is a striking woman with black hair, tall with a strong brain and a blazing smile. I measure black of hair against the black of my mother's hair, ebony, obsidian, onyx, ink. And if I overuse any form of the word to blaze, it is because there is no other means to describe my mother's smile or Susan Sontag's either. Thank you. <laughs> David Gates, Sigrid Nunez, jump in, please. Jump in, David. Well, that intimidated the hell out of me. That wasn't the idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, probably no one knows about the 10-year-long affair that I have with Susan sometimes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, try another one. Um, I'm, I'm someone, uh, I, I would assume that all of you have had encountered her. I never had. Um, I'm just a reader and an admirer of hers. And I suppose the thing that, well, like Honor, that um, essay against interpretation was a very important uh, piece for me in which she called for um, an erotics of art as opposed to a hermeneutics of art, um, which at the time that I was in graduate school, um, that just made such powerful sense to me because it was the kind of criticism that um, that I was interested in and that was um, somehow falling out of favor then. And of course, it's now like <laughs> gone completely out the window. Um, but the, the the thing I think that. I admire most about her is her focus on words and her focus on what words mean. And I'm thinking especially of two examples. In um, AIDS and its metaphors, um, she comes down very hard on the use of the word plague to, dis to, yes. to characterize AIDS. And, um, she, you know, explains the derivation. Uh, it, it derives from the word for stroke. <clears throat> a plague is originally a punishment that has been meted out. And she focused very strongly on that word. She, she focused on a few other words, too. Um, mm -hmm. the, the metaphor of full-blown AIDS, you know, AIDS when you've really got it. And that metaphor comes from um, a flower <coughs> blossoming. And that posits an inevitability mm. about developing, you know, mm. a severe, severe, yeah. And 
she, you know, and she focused on those little things, uh, supposedly little things, but which are actually huge things. And then in um, her notorious piece in The New Yorker after 9-11, um, she came down very hard on the official rhetoric that this was a cowardly attack. And she said, well, actually, no. Uh, yeah, these people may have been monsters, but this was, you know, this was not, you could not call this cowardly. If you want to talk about cowardly, maybe you talk about um, <laughs> launching some, something from, you know, 800 miles away. She got in so much shit for this. But she was absolutely right that people who were using that word um, as a general purpose insult. And she, you know, perhaps with the blinkers on and not realizing how it would be received, but she homed in on that word. And I always thought that was just a, a, a wonderful characteristic of hers. And that's, you know, and that is the erotics of language. You know, she's, you know, um, Nabokov talks about caressing the divine detail. And I think that's, what she was just exceptionally good at, and so smart, so smart. And that's about all I have to say. Well, you know, I just want to add one little detail. She said, I'm a very slow writer. Mm -hmm. um, which I, Always good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, she was, she was a very slow writer. Um, I've, I've, it's been on my mind lately uh, something that she said. Uh, she was she was in her last illness, and so the, the the discussion had been about why would you want to you know why 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 does one want to live a long life what 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 would she miss this kind of thing, and. Kind of as a joke, she said it, it, it was it was presented that the, the world was going to hell in a handbasket, etc. And uh, she said something like, "I just want to see how much more stupid things can get." <laughs> you can imagine why this has come to my mind many times. I, I, I think I know where you're going with this. <laughs> um, that was 2004. Yeah, that was 2004. Um, also, I just wanted to say that. Uh, it's interesting because uh, this uh, this season there's also there's the debriefing these collected stories of a Susan Sontag's that come, have come out, and also the collected essays of Elizabeth Hardwick, uh, and yeah. of course they were they were friends they knew each other for a long time, um, and uh, and they they were both <coughs> mentors of mine people I met uh, when I was quite young, and um, and just. I'm just reminded also because of things that you've all said that uh, something else that, that's, that's gone or that I associate with, uh, with both of these people and with a, a certain kind of world and an attitude towards, towards literature um, is that, uh, you know, they both, they both had this idea of writing um, and the practice of writing as a religion, mm -hmm. as something to be taken absolutely seriously and that you, you were devoted to it wasn't just something that, that, that you, you, you did. Um, and, uh, you know, my memory is that one of the reasons why uh, Susan was so important to me was that I felt that, um, that she, she, you know, she gave you permission to, to take yourself absolutely seriously. It wasn't, you know, and, and to think that you were doing something that was Extremely worthy, and and in fact, in, in her view, the mo the most the most worthy thing that you could do, the most you know, I think she really did believe that the writer's life was the best life that you could have, um, and and the slowness comes from this this uh, you know this paying attention to words, the you know the the draft after draft after draft, and I think I it was I think it was right around when I when I met her, uh, she was writing one of the uh, photography essays. And that would have been about maybe 20 pages, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she, said, she said, oh, look, I, I went through a <clears throat> ream of paper while writing that essay, which is 500 pages. 
so she, she had typed it that many times. She had typed it and then sat with the pencil and gone over it and over and over it. And that was for that, that one essay. Um, and there was also, she had probably read about 20 books in order to write that essay. Um, I was thinking also, though, that uh, you know, because we're, you know, because we have these these stories now, that how how um, how fraught the whole thing was for her. This that she she was never, I mean, she was somebody who unfortunately uh, did did see herself very often as somebody who had failed. She saw herself as a failure. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes even as, you know, as, as happens with really successful people in, in a, lot, a lot of fields, as, as, as an imposter, that imposter syndrome mm -hmm. that affects people. Um, and, and, and she really did, uh, uh, she really was kind of tormented, particularly about how she didn't, she didn't do enough with fiction. She needed more time and, she, and that she was, <coughs> She was she was too too conflicted about what what it meant to write fiction. Also that uh, she you know she did strongly regret uh, that she hadn't spent more time on the fiction rather than the essays and and did uh, you know got tired of, of everybody always saying that the essays are are, are the, the the really really fine work and and the fiction doesn't mm -hmm. doesn't doesn't live up to that. Um, so I actually, I, I haven't actually prepared something to read, but I, from something else that I, that I wrote, which I, I had been asked to give a, a, a talk in, the, in, in Beijing, I, that was Hurricane Sandy, I never made it. But the, 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 the topic that they gave me was simply literature and ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I thought, oh, you could now, I didn't have no idea what they, you know, and there was a, you know, a, a language problem here too. Um, but anyway, uh, and so for, for part of that, I was, I was thinking about her. And so there were, there was, there were a, couple, a couple of things I want, I, I want to pick out from there. Um, okay, and, and she, a, a writer of brilliant essays, admired above all for her intellectual gifts, uh, Sontag suffered lifelong anguished regret that she had not done a better job of writing fiction. In fact, she produced four novels and a volume of short stories and was the recipient of several awards for fiction writing. But the fear that there was something wrong, some essential thing missing from her fiction, the fear that she might be too much of a thinker, too austere and discursive ever to be a great no novelist never left her. Uh, so this is an entry from, from her journal in 1970. We've, she says, um, she announces hopefully that she is at last, quote, ready to learn how to write, to think with words instead of ideas. Perhaps she had in mind the famous exchange between the poet Mallarmé and the painter Degas. One day when the two men were discussing poetry, Degas, who wished also to write poetry, explained, it's not that I don't have any ideas for poems, I have too many, but Degas, said Mallarmé, you don't make a poem with ideas, you make it with words. Um, and seven years later, she, she makes this note. Only one thing that counts are ideas. Behind ideas are moral principles. Either one is serious or one is not. Uh, mm -hmm. Elsewhere in her journal, she laments that the great weakness of contemporary American literature, including, including poetry, is that, quote, it is anti-intellectual. It has no great ideas. Mm -hmm. And we find her fretting also that one reason there are no more novels, by which I think she meant great novels, um, might be because there are no exciting new theories of relation of society to self, sociological, historical, philosophical. Um, all right, her journals are full of ideas for stories, novels, novellas, and plays that are most striking for being completely abstract. Write a book about the body, but not a schizophrenic book. Is that possible? <laughs> Reads a typical note. Um, for years, she, taught, she toyed with the idea of writing a novel about the effects of mechanical and technological speed on modern society. Um, okay, but, but you know, so we, let me see. Okay. When in the middle age she looked back on her own early cerebral experimental novels, she found them seriously wanting. Uh, clearly, she had been on the wrong track. She would have loved to do something else, to write that other kind of novel, loose, impressionistic, a bold, rich, rhythmic prose poem of a novel like, say, Wolf's The Waves uh, had always been her dream. Uh, I confess I was shocked but not really surprised to read in her journal this remark about 
her friend Elizabeth Hardwick, a judgment that mingles envy with disdain, no ideas, <laughs> but what music. Um, and when after a break of many years she began writing novels again, she thought she'd hit upon a solution. Her last two novels are both works of historical fiction, a genre much more conducive to discursiveness and the discussion of ideas, and in which a certain authoritative tone would not be so jarring. In other words, set your novel in Hugo's age, and you might still get away with playing the role of his historian of morals and ideas. Um, all right. So, moving well, on. I might, I might just jump in because. Um, you jump in. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Um, there's no hiding it. If anybody can Google my name and hers, you'll find my very severe re review of the Volcano Lover. Oh! Uh -huh. um, we did know about that when we asked you. Yeah, I didn't even I figure forgot. maybe, you know, you should which learn, was, which was you should learn the week. Google. <laughs> learn the Google, Ben. Uh-huh. Um, is this in Newsweek? Yeah, yeah. it was in Newsweek. And um, I faulted her essentially for the same kind of thing she was faulting herself. But, nevertheless, I will never forget this one passage in The Volcano Lover where um, they're walking on the lava, which is yes. kind of hot. Uh, do you remember this? And it's, and it's like walking on flesh. Wow. There's, you know, and once read, never forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, but when I knew I was coming here, I looked again at the way we live now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's um, kind of an amazing piece of fiction. A couple of weeks ago, I taught The Death of Ivan Ilyich, and I wish that I had remembered this story because I think that those two uh, would pair together yep. very nicely, yeah. very nicely, um, as, as opposites in a way, because in that story, um, the guy who, is, who has got AIDS and who is not yet dead at the end is not named, mm -hmm. nor is the disease named. I mean, there's, there's a silence about both of those things, uh, which I think absolutely needs to be true of yeah. that story. Well, oh, the, the other thing it does, which seems sort of unsuntagian <clears throat> in a way, is that it, it really involves the reader. You know, because yeah. yeah. you're thinking of all your friends who, right? Who, you know, right. Yeah. 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 Right. from the heart of the crisis. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's interesting because I remember um, Mark Strand. I think it was Mark Strand uh, saying somewhere when uh, when you're writing, if something comes easy to you, pay attention because that's your gift. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, I love the story about Susan writing The Way We Live Now because she was in the bathtub, she said. Really? She was in the bathtub and she had the idea. The first, basically say the first sentence came to her or something. And she said she, she, she jumped out of the bathtub and grabbed a towel and went and sat down and started to write it. And it came easier than anything she had ever written, hmm. she said. and. Um, she finished it so quickly. I think the story went that what she was so happy about was from that moment in the bathtub and it's coming out in the New Yorker was only like two weeks or three weeks. Or the shortest possible time. Good Christ. And, and what did she follow that little story with? With She said, well, you know, that rarely happens. That happens once in a whatever. She said, because, you know, she said, but I knew I had something. I knew it was good mm -hmm. because, you know, mostly I feel whatever I write is shit. Mm -hmm. So she, she, that you know that, that so that's it. So so yeah. So so I always thought of those two things together. That it came. That yeah. I think I think she would have written more stories like that if she had spent more time writing fiction and if she had lived longer. It's it's so hard to know. I mean, I don't know what the right way to go about it is either. And I, I think in a way, you know, I, I never knew her, but I think. She was so intelligent that that can be a handicap for fiction writers. Um, yes. Can be a great handicap. You two are such dummies. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, speaking for myself, I wouldn't want to. Nobody's going to get me in a ring with Miss Sontag. <laughs> 
fiction really it it, it changed. I, I, you know, the, it, you know, you see here the you know with, when she wrote Unguided Tours, she also had that feeling. Mm -hmm. It was something <clears throat> different, and uh, you know this this kind of I don't know what do you what do you call it? It's, it's like a it's like a well now people would call it a lyric essay. Yeah. That would be the okay. Yeah. So, and I think she was the the old stories aren't like that, and pilgrimage isn't like mm -hmm. that. Um, but she was moving towards that. I mean, mm -hmm. and I think that that I think that's why why I think that that she was happy with that, and it was easier for her. Mm -hmm. That's why I think she would go if she would have written stories. But of course, with the novels, she could have tried to work on novels like that too. Mm -hmm. But she. But but she chose to do the historical novel, which is really quite different. Yeah, and she called the volcano lover a romance, right? Which is, I mean, she is a, was was aware of all the resonance and the history behind that word. That's an interesting choice of word for her. There's the novel and there's the romance. Yeah, I well, mean, I didn't. So, go on. Well, I was just going to say that the French word for uh, novel is right. poem, and it's yeah. related to yeah. romance. Yeah. But I didn't understand why she didn't um, why why she why she didn't uh, follow more say the example of of, of Kundera, you know the the essay novel that's set in the present which mm -hmm. which would have given I mean if you think of something like the unbearable light uh, of the you know where where or Hadia Marias like that kind of where mm -hmm. where you where there's a story there's a plot there are these there are these you know conventional traditional elements. But there's room for uh, philosophy, like, like Naipaul, for mm. example. I mean, you know, and he called meditative interrogations. That's what mm. George Eliot. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, but just where because then she could have uh, there'd be a, there would be a place for her to to be smart, uh, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to to be well. She she does it in in Volcano Lover and in, in America. But the thing is, I don't know which, why she felt that uh, why she didn't. Think about writing that kind of novel set in in the present because she also beat herself up about writing the historical novels. But you know, could could you really be a great novelist if you didn't deal with your own times? Mm -hmm. And she did admire uh, Kundera's fiction, that mm -hmm. kind of fiction, and Naipaul's and Zabel's. Mm -hmm. So there there were examples, and yeah. So I was very curious about that. Is that you know Peter Hanke? Mm -hmm. We think of earlier mm -hmm. people. Um, mm -hmm. I hear a little strain of Beckett just in that piece that you read, Ben, the Sisyphus, <coughs> the Sisyphus thing. That has a very Beckett sound to it. Um, I, yeah, I particularly like uh, the briefing and the answers to that, the, yep, the, the, that's this, uh, your description of what she might have gone uh, further with. Um, uh, she was a cosmopolitan, and this is a good thing in and of itself, but not necessarily the best thing for a fiction writer. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, fiction is, is provincial. Uh, uh, it has to do with people in particular places turned in on one another and furiously involved with their own lives. Uh, uh, so I, don't, I, I, I understand why uh, a lesser intellectual like, like William Faulkner uh, or Ernest Hemingway uh, uh, produced a, a a lot more fiction and uh, uh, changed literary history. Uh, but uh, I do feel that uh, uh, you, can, you can see a growth in this story. I didn't put the stories in chronological order. I didn't want to do that. But looking at, at the earliest stories, like The Dummy, for example, uh, uh, I see a, a too strong influence of Donald Barthelme, mm -hmm. whom yeah. she uh, admired yeah. extravagantly, yeah. too extravagantly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, she had to uh, grow out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this, is, yes. this is a career in which a, an extremely gifted person grew up in public, uh, yeah. and, yeah. and uh, there's poignancy in that. But yeah. when she gets to what I think for her is a more uh, uh, fruitful influence in Hardwick, she's writing stories uh, uh, more like, uh, more like Debriefing, or uh, or even pilgrimage mm. yes, at the end, uh, unguided tour. There's no there's no more influence of Barthelme or mm. Pynchon or any yeah. of the, that that yeah. once very fashionable domineering yeah. school yeah. of uh, American high literary yeah. art. Uh, that's gone, and um, she's uh, she's come under new influences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, including. Elizabeth Hardwick's Sleepless Nights mm -hmm. and Renata Adler. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think that really was her home. 
that 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 would have mm -hmm. been her home for fiction. I I, I really mm -hmm. believe that. I think those are books that have a lot to do. Oh, something. I I don't know. I see somebody in the audience who knows <coughs> more about this than I do, uh, or any of us. But I think that Rilke's uh, yes. Multilarts Brigga uh, might have been the. Uh, uh, the great code behind yeah. uh, all of this writing that is meditative, uh, yes. that episodic and meditative yeah. and uh, journalistic wo wo mm -hmm. and woven. Mm -hmm. And the narrator is a, a writer. And the narrator is first person. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Notebooks of multiple yeah. arts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, well, we have time for. Oh no, I had I had an observation so wacky that I'll just save it for the next time we talk about no, Susan. Now, Okay. Uh, all right. Jesus okay. Like okay. Um, I, I I had a, a a wacky theory about David Foster Wallace, which is that he was primarily a genius and secondarily a writer, and I feel that Sontag is primarily a genius. Um, most of you know, and, and I think most of her gift was for. Um, the essay and for the you know for the for the writing about ideas and I th and and it's natural that she would try for fiction because you know she she was ambitious and she may have considered herself unproductive but she produced a hell of a lot but I think that um, I think that in both of those cases the genius kind of hovered above whatever that genius happened to get poured into. Mm -hmm. And she was so in love with ideas and so in love with reading and with books. Mm -hmm. um, it seems right to me that she ended up giving the most of her time and attention to what she gave it to. Mm -hmm. um, questions? Yes. I have not a question, but something I'd like to share um, apropos of what <coughs> you said. Um, Sontag got uh, an honorary degree from Harvard uh, at the same time as the same year as Ravi Shankar. And Ravi Shankar had a birthday very shortly after that. And I, he, for some absolutely unknown reason, apart from the fact that I had interviewed Ravi Shankar many times, uh, he invited me to his birthday party. And there were just four of us. Ravi Shankar and me and Sontag and Lipovics. Oh my God. Oh, jeez. I felt, I, I wanted to go into the crowd and what am I doing here with these trees? And they were having this fantastic conversation. And each one had brought a gift for the other, which was of their own work. And there I was, an absolute disciple. <laughs> And Sontag came up to me. Ravi Shankar and I had a friendship because I had interviewed him for so many, so many, so many times, and I had been a fan of his since I was ten, and he knew all that. But I don't know why he invited only me in this very tiny dinner. And Sontag came up to me and had a long conversation, and her, I was just amazed by her curiosity. Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. wanted to ask me about <coughs> India and more, mostly about Salman Rushdie. Mm -hmm. And she said, mm -hmm. "How? what do you think about him? And she solicited my opinion as though I was some great critic. <laughs> and then she said, how, how do they res respond to him in India? And we had a long conversation, which was really very, very, very generous of her. Mm -hmm. So I'll never forget that. I mean, I've always admired her writing, but this was something amazing because it was <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, other, other questions? Or comments? Comments. Yes. Uh, just a comment. Uh, I've enjoyed this so much this evening. And the comment about what would I get if I live long? You know? Well, I could get to go to many more of these wonderful events the longer I live. So I'm just hoping it was great. Thank you. But on photography, because it was mm. the first book that I became aware of by Susan Sontag, and I was a young photographer, and I read that book. And so I'm wondering 
does anybody have anything to say about the book on photography? Is it sort of different from her other musings? Is it part of her canon of work that kind of goes along? Because I don't really honestly know a lot of the other work, and on photography is the only book I've read by her. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a pretty central uh, book yeah. of that essay, <coughs> of that uh, period of her work. Mm -hmm. And it, like, uh, I mean, I have not reread it recently, but like a lot of her work, she upended, I received ideas about <coughs> photography and about, and asked moral questions um, about something that in general one didn't ask moral questions mm. about. Yeah. Uh, and that's what she often did. Yeah. Uh, and that's why reading her was so, is, continues to be so bracing. It's like, oh, I, I never yeah. thought of that, yeah. you know. Yeah. And um, it's just this wonderful uh, gift that she had. Well, it was, it was a gift, but it was very intentional, you know, yeah. uh, to do that. Yeah. And I think made some photographers very angry. I oh, remember I'm sure. one in particular. Yeah. Yeah. I that the, there was, there was something uh, uh, deprecatory in, in the evaluation of an art that could not understand the world but could only collect it. I think that was mm -hmm. the language. I haven't read the book in a long time either. But um, at book length, she had a way of pressing an argument very hard and sometimes yeah. I think yeah. maybe even surprising herself. Yeah. One of my favorite things ever said about Susan Sontag, and we might just uh, close with it is what Margaret Atwood has recently said. She ran received opinion through the shredder and looked at things again. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, yeah. Yeah. sums her up pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and thank, thank you all you for being here. Yeah. This might be kind of a big question. So. Uh, uh, <laughs> I've never read any of Susan Sontag's fiction, um, but I've read a lot of her essays, my favorite essay being Against Interpretation, um, which maybe kind of is relevant to this a little bit of a back and forth tension happening in, in here, because I would see that essay as very debilitating for me if I had ever written it, because the essay is, as you probably all know, um, takes a staunch stance kind of against um, allegory, against art that uh, serves um, toward a more, I don't know, unambiguous purpose, um, something that she thought was a bad thing for art to have, that art was supposed to, I don't know, maybe be more of a description of the ambiguity of life. And uh, I'm kind of just putting it in my own words, and maybe you all disagree with that too, and I'd be curious to hear about that. But I was wondering how much you felt like maybe her fiction does embody this kind of uh, resistance toward, toward a, um, unambiguous content allegorizing allegorical work. If, if you feel like the spirit of against interpretation is something she's able to embody in her fiction too. Well, I, I think I can do no better than to paraphrase uh, Benjamin Moser, her, her biographer, who said in the New York Times, that it is a, a canard that Susan Sontag's uh, uh, best work is in her uh, nonfiction and her worst work is in her fiction. Uh, 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 there are lousy essays and there are magnificent stories and, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, this extraordinary talent and originality is, is spread right through. And, and, and also the, the fiction is all different, you know, the stories are all very, they're written over a long period of time and then they're in the novel, so, that, so they're all different from one another and she was always working things out, experimenting and so on, so it, it, it's, it, it, you, you couldn't really, you know, this idea that you have with that against her, it, it wouldn't really fit everything that she, that she wrote, it's, a, it's such a range, really. Um, that was a polemical stance and a bit of a trap for the literal minded, which is what polemic at this <clears throat> high cultural level often is, and I thought she—I think she feels that that was a battle that was uh, was waged yeah. and won yeah. and over with. Mm -hmm. uh, she was she was uh, 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 like many creative intellectuals. She was always 
restless, always moving on and, and abandoning positions mm -hmm. that she had once yeah. held sacred. Mm -hmm. And this is what I value most in her career. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you, thank you all. Very much.